All right, hi there. Um, we're here with two remarkable people, uh, Todd Dufresne and Caroline Farkas, um, and we're just going to be talking about climate change, COVID, how to cope with it, um, mental illness, and how mental illness is associated with um, the pandemic and climate change as well. Um, so before we begin, I just want to let them both introduce themselves. That's more fun than me doing it. So Todd, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy at Lakehead University here in uh, Thunder Bay, which is in northwestern Ontario. Uh, I'm known as a Freud guy, mostly a critic, and um, I have uh, recently moved into a different world, which is pretty new to me. You know, I've only been working in this for like the last eight years or so, and that's uh, work on climate change. And uh, so the last two books I have bridged those two concerns. The last one was on Freud in 2017. And uh, the one we're probably going to talk about today is from 2019 called The Democracy of Suffering. It's a beauty. Yeah, we'll totally talk about it today. Thank you so much. Carol Ann, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Carol Ann Farkas. I'm a professor of English and Health Humanities at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Boston in the U.S. And uh, my research over the years has been on how ordinary people make sense of health and wellness through popular cultures. And um, through that, I've become more involved in the scholarship of the health humanities. <clears throat> and then that has led me kind of inevitably to being concerned about how um, uh, being concerned about the ultimate health problem that we are all facing, which is the health of our planet. So that's how you and I have met. We've become involved in uh, working on eco-anxiety, and eco-grief, and the way in which people talk about that in pop, pop culture spaces in different different media. That's wonderful. Yeah, so I um, that's so great. You're both, uh, I don't know how you do everything you do. <laughs> You're amazing. I admire you both so much. But um, yeah, I guess I should mention, um, I'm an interdisciplinary instructor at Quantum Polytechnic University. Uh, I did my PhD at Oxford. And then since then, I've just been on an interdisciplinary route and just having fun meeting people like you, which has been so nice. Um, so yeah, Carol and I are um, co-authoring a chapter for the Rutledge Handbook of Health and Media. Um, so climate health is human health. I'm just excited to talk about that with the democracy of suffering because the chapter with the democracy of suffering just speak to one another so well. Um, so I think it'll lead to really fruitful conversation. Um, so maybe Maybe I'll start with Todd. Do you want to just sort of elaborate on what you mean by the democracy of suffering? And I think you use the globalization of empathy too, right? Yeah, I have uh, both of those in that book. Uh, well, the democracy of suffering is, is, was a turn of phrase that just came up in passing while I wrote this book. The book was really meant to be called something like answering the question, what is the Anthropocene condition? Uh, but that seemed too boring for my editor. So, uh, this notion that I had in passing, which was the democracy of suffering, he liked it. And, uh, and I built it up a little bit in the, in the book to become a little bit more central. Um, in a way, what all I'm trying to say is that um, the globalization of, uh, the, well, strike that, climate change is a global issue which affects everyone. It doesn't affect everybody equally, but nonetheless, it'll change the way we live in the world. And I'm suggesting that we're already feeling something like the democracy of suffering insofar as people are starting to uh, realize and share in the actual experience of this suffering and along the lines that you're more interested in, how in fact we are starting to share it even vicariously through something that I call the globalization or the, uh, the idea is that um, of course people will experience uh, climate change in various ways, but that perhaps a different kind of notion of empathy allows us to understand that we're all feeling for example, an event like uh, the fires in Australia in a way that makes us uh, more attuned than ever to a uh, uh, different kind of consciousness. And that, that, that I think is there's some, there's some hope in that. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how far I run with it. I'm kind of working on it right now and trying to think about it these days uh, and try to extend the notion of uh, the globalization of empathy and how far I want to go with it. So I'm interested to hear what you two have to say about it as well. That's so wonderful. Um, Carol Ann, that fits so well with I want, what I want to talk to you about, and then you can just add on to it. But it made me think of, I think I've sent you this quotation, Todd, before from uh, Mary Shelley's The Last Man, which is about a plague that destroys all of humanity, hopeful. Um, and 
there he they refer to the plague as the the great equalizer um so they're like you're exactly saying right now with with covid is they're all experiencing suffering and just collectively and realizing that there isn't anything different between them at this point in this sort of catastrophe. So that's so interesting. And then I was thinking, so you're talking about like collectivity and shared discourses. Um, so Caroline, you do a lot of work on how the written word can sort of help us sort of engage with the climate emergency and sort of as sort of eco anxiety and eco grief as this kind of um, shared illness experience. Um, do you mind talking more about that? Sure. Um, well, in the health humanities, um, we're interested uh, a lot in, in narrative, how people tell their stories, and then the, the value that those stories have in allowing us to communicate with one another. Um, I, I, we take it for granted in health humanities, and I, I'm taking it for granted that everybody else takes it for granted, <laughs> that, that narrative is a just like a fundamental form of communication for, for people that everyone can understand. And so I think that people telling their stories, whether it's through writing or more through multimedia kinds of interactions, people are able to, um, like Todd mentioned, the fires in Australia that's so far away from where we are in North America, and yet we can still share in those people's stories through maybe through written accounts, but also more immediately through um, through people's testimony of what they're experiencing uh, through video and and social media and uh, all the all the channels that we have now that are available for us and so using um, using our, our storytelling capacity um, talking about our experiences critiquing our experiences calling one another to action i think is a really important piece of this as well so that we can promote the empathy through talking about what's happening but then we can move from the empathy to the action through calling on one another um, through whatever medium we use to pay attention pay attention to one another pay attention to what's happening on the planet and uh ideally do something about it that's so beautifully said and yeah you both use similar words like um, more attuned and paying more attention to this idea of being present and aware and then again acting on that um, sort of awareness um, maybe i'll quickly unless Todd, you have something you want to respond to there it sort of fits with my question just about youth activism and the role that's kind of playing in uh, the movement itself do you mind elaborating on that too uh well the the, I think the most important leadership in the climate movement movement right now is coming from younger people. Um, Greta Thunberg is one obvious example, but there are many young people, and especially young women, which I think is amazing. Um, young people um, from indigenous groups as well. So yes, youth to power. Um, so so people who are speaking out from historically more marginalized. Parts of the discourse community are the ones who are actually coming to the fore. They're, they're, they have nothing to lose. They are not. Um, they're, they're not thoroughly uh, indoctrinated and kind of jaded by more traditional forms of communication. They, they just think I can text people. I can make a YouTube channel, and I'm just going to tell everyone we need to be doing something. And um, they're, they're bypassing a lot of the traditional more hierarchical um proper channels totally. this came up <laughs> this came up recently in a, a dispute at work about how we get people to take action should we just wait for leadership to take to take action through proper channels we don't have time and i really love that about the young the the youth activists that um they they don't know they don't care about all the bureaucratic process they just want to get stuff done <laughs> that's amazing uh, so then todd i wanted to ask you about that too um just about um sort of we, you mentioned consciousness like so you i think you said shift in human consciousness in your in your book and i think that's really powerful and i was just wondering maybe elaborate on that and then maybe how you think we might do that yeah much easier said than done um i would just extend uh what Carol Ann is saying as well, I mean, when, when the statement that young people have nothing to lose now, in some ways it's, it's because we're already seeing the breakdown of 
formerly uh, predictable patterns associated with uh, capitalism and uh, promotion through the ranks and things like that, young people simply see a different kind of future for themselves. Or, or maybe more accurately, they're not sure what the future is going to look like for themselves because it seems to be uh, coming undone before their very eyes. So in some ways, like they're at the same time that they've like pretty much opted out of uh, um, television watching and news watching, they get, they're already set up to receive information totally differently than my generation was and maybe even your generation. And so they're really primed to not really think the way that we thought before. So I think already they're primed to be different. They think about the world differently. They're kind of different subjects of the world. This is a technological change, but it's also an economic change because of the opportunities that are lacking. I would emphasize that because in some ways I often think people will talk, for example, about say millennials, slightly older group uh, of, of people that are activists. And I always wonder if in part they're activists almost out of necessity because the rug's been pulled out from underneath them. Um, the thing is, I don't think the rug is going to be put underneath under, under them at any time soon. So I think they're permanent members of this new movement. But I think that their support initially was, was soft support. It's, not, it's support around the side that they see that it hasn't really worked out for them the way it was kind of promised by their parents, maybe yeah. by society. And so really, I guess, you know, the first layer of discussing how things are changing in terms of consciousness is just a very basic one. The economy is changing around us. Technologies are getting, are different. Different generations have different sort of ways. And these are just changing the way they engage with the world. Um, so that maybe they don't think it's worthwhile getting a university degree, which was obviously, you know, once upon a time, a necessity to move forward in life. But if there's no job ahead, why exactly would you study? Or if you study, maybe you'd study philosophy because if you're not going to have a job, you might as well do something that you like rather than something that maybe you think is practical. These, so I would start, instead of talking more highfalutin or artsy about how consciousness changes, I would say that it's first of all just changing of necessity because it always does change. It's always associated with uh, communication technologies we have. It's being overlaid with a massive change, however, with the economy and the opportunities that people have. And the lack of opportunity is making people simply look for different answers, which is why young people, millennials, for example, can support Bernie Sanders despite the fact he's an old man. It doesn't matter because he's speaking their language. He's finally found his, his group and it's not his, it's not his peers. It's the young people. You know, that's that. amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, that's uh, so well said. The idea, too, of like collective consciousness. So there's the idea of consciousness as subjective experience. And we all have our unique sort of experiences in the world. Um, but then the idea of this like collective consciousness that we're all part of and consciousness does like expand and grow as we get older. And so with evolution, it's also so they literally are smarter than us, those kids, uh, just evolutionary, which I think um, and it really does show like a lot of the students I have, too, they're already like I'm trying to sort of we talk about activism, but a lot of them are already right in it and totally into it. So that really resonated the idea of their activists of necessity. They kind of just grew into it. So they don't know anything different. Almost. I think that's really interesting. Um, what do you think, Caroline, just about the idea of like the collective consciousness? And again, the sort of activism and compassion and how we are actually going to achieve a shift in consciousness. I think um, in our chapter, we talked about like, it's called an eco awakening um, yeah. too. And so, yeah, what, um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, yeah, I was thinking about that this afternoon, uh, getting ready for this talk and thinking about what um, Todd has said in his work about this, this shift in consciousness and towards greater empathy um, I, I, it seems, and I, I think our research has, has confirmed this, that people are increasingly more, um, aware of, uh, climate change and, and climate, climate collapse. And they're also, um, much more concerned about it. People want to do something about it. And they're, they're able to communicate with like-minded people in ways that perhaps, was not so easy in, in recent decades. Um, the, I don't know, I belong to a couple of zero waste Facebook groups and we just trade tips for how we're all going to compost our way to, um, saving the planet, which, you know, is a like misguided neoliberal thing in its own right. We could talk about separately, but, um, 
but it does seem that, that more and more people are just coming to be concerned and they want to do something. They just don't know what and, um, or, 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 or where to start. I think there's a real hunger for leadership and obviously in the United States, we have none. <laughs> um, I, but I think it's encouraging that <clears throat> there are countries where this has become a matter of concern from the highest levels of government all the way down to ordinary people. And um, that makes me, that makes me feel more optimistic. And the more, the more it just becomes part of our daily lives that we, you know, one of the things we are doing every day is trying to make the planet better. That would be really awesome. Um, so I'm optimistic that this eco awakening can happen. Um, and yet, I don't know, I'm also like a little skeptical about its pace. I'm worried about how, whether, whether we're moving fast enough. Um, the, the COVID pan pandemic has brought out a lot of people's empathy and compassion and cooperation in many ways, but there's just so much of what we see driving um, case numbers in the U.S. right now is really um, mindless selfishness. <laughs> and so that's kind of, dis that's been discouraging to see. And I hope that that is not, I, I hope that that's actually just like less widespread than it seems. <laughs>